Hi, I'm Susan from Austin, Texas, and I support Adoptees On because I have felt so alone all my life in this strange journey that only another adopted person can understand. When I found Adoptees On, I found a connection to a community that is supportive and where I'm deeply understood. I hope that you will join me as a Patreon supporter of Adoptees On so that more adoptees can discover this community and find the connection they're looking for. Choose your sponsorship level at adopteeson.com slash partner. Thank you. You're listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. This is episode 193, Mar. I'm your host, Haley Radke. Today's episode is a part of our Adoptees On Spirituality series. I invited Mar Miriam on to talk about something I think a lot of adopted folks could relate to. Do we have to choose between our biological family and our adoptive family? What about choosing between their religions? Mar shares how they are both Jewish and Catholic. We talk through how they chose adult conversion to Judaism as a way to be permanently grafted onto their adoptive family. Mar is also very open about how recovery programs have helped them to identify as spiritual but not religious. We wrap up with some recommended resources, and as always, links to everything we'll be talking about today are on the website adoptezon.com. Let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome to Adoptees On, Mar. Welcome, Mar. Hi, Haley. I'm so glad to be talking with you. Great to be here. I would love it if you would share some of your story with us. Well, I think I'll tell you the part that I remember as I, as I was told it when I was the youngest. So when I was about five, I remember my adoptive mom pointed to her belly and said, this is where babies come from, but you came from someone else's belly, not mine. And I remember I was about the height of her belly and all of that information was very overwhelming and scary. The idea that I came from someone that I didn't know was really just mushed together with the idea of babies and mommies. And uh, so I was just overwhelmed by all of that information. And along with that, she explained to me that she and my dad and my brother picked me up at an office and that I was about three months old and that they adopted me. But I really didn't get the full understanding of what it meant to be adopted. You know, um, I just had some very, very childlike ideas about having come from somewhere else. So this part's really unique to my story. The name of the adoption business was called the airport, which was a, a play on words, H-E-I-R-P-O-R-T, airport. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm just cringing so... I know, I've never heard anyone, I know, I've never heard anyone else come from there, but that was also beyond my ability to understand that that was a joke. So I thought I came from an office at an airport as though I came in on an airplane. And that just was part of my my childhood imagination of coming from a different world. I know I'm not unique as an adoptee thinking that I came from someplace else besides Earth. But a little bit after that, sometime between the time I was five and seven, I came to understand that my had had a daughter who died at age seven, and that was her biological daughter, and that she and my adoptive father and an adoptive brother, he's a biological child of theirs, um, that they were all grieving the loss of this girl who had had a sudden illness and had been healthy one day and dead the next. And they were in a big hurry to adopt another girl because they really wanted to complete their family. And I got to be that very special someone that completed their family. I also was selected in part because my birthday was the day after that girl was born. 
So her birthday was August 24th. My birthday is August 25th. And my mom thought that that was a sign, some kind of a cosmic sign that I was meant to belong to them. Looking back as an adult on that, (laughs) to be, did you feel like a replacement child? I didn't have that language for it then. I have, of course, have over the years since then come to think a lot about this idea of replacement. And I just want to say that they didn't think that they were giving me that message. And they, to this day, insist that they never intended to send me that message. They were they were wanting to have their family as a whole whole again. And they really felt like a girl was what was going to make them whole again after having a girl in addition to their son. But they also really, they really thought that they had a lot of love to give and that they wanted to give love to a child in order to help them heal and to become whole again. So while yes, I did get the message that I was a replacement for her. I really tried to keep in mind that that was unintentionally communicated to me. But I was so little and I was having these ideas of my own that I did not know how to make sense out of. And I didn't know who to turn to to ask. That was a big part of it is that I got a lot of confusing information and a lot of that confusing information just got more and more confusing the more that I heard so so let me just say that what I was told about where I came from was that I had a mother with a first name, a father with a first name, and very few pieces of non-identifying information that were written down on a little index card. And that was what I had that gave me proof that I had been born, that I came from somewhere. That, that mysterious somewhere. And then there were a few things that they told me about what they knew about my original family. And one of the only things I knew is that they were Catholic. And the family that adopted me was Jewish. But as a Jewish family, I'm not so sure that my mom knew how to explain to me what it meant to be Catholic. And I don't think she had the ability to appreciate how scary it was for me to hear that I was somehow not quite Catholic and not quite Jewish, Mm -hmm. but that I was also in some ways a little bit Catholic and a little bit Jewish. So I realized that there are many people who do not spend a lot of time thinking about this, but I was really consumed with thoughts about this. So, so let me say that I had some Spanish speaking caregivers from the time I, well, for as long back as I can remember. I don't remember a time when I didn't have these women in, in our home when I was little and I was learning to speak Spanish. And one of the things I knew about these women is that they were Catholic. So I associated where I came from with what I was learning about these women. And I also saw them as somehow interchangeable and and expendable because they would move on and I would never see them again. So they were very much part of my, my care and my sense of identity. And yet it was another source of loss for me. So I wanted to mention that. And, um, it was very confusing to me that they were caring for me while they were also leaving their children at home. So here I was with an adoptive family in addition to these women taking care of me, and then their children didn't have them and didn't have anyone else taking care of them, which for me was part of wondering who, who is this birth mother out there who who gave birth to me and isn't here now and is she like these women is she taking care of other people's children and not her own because one of the only things that i knew is that my birth mother and my birth father were not married 
and they could not give me the education that my adoptive family could give me, and they were whore. But as a child, I didn't understand the relationship between being poor, married or unmarried, and Catholic or not Catholic. And so these were very, very big ideas. So that's that's really the gist of what I would say my story was up until I uh, started to learn about being an adoptee and talking to other adopted people which I started in high school. Um, My adoptive parents were very open to me seeking out information about what it meant to be adopted. And I went to a group in California, which at the time was called a triad group. Uh, The organization I was involved in brought together birth parents, adoptive parents, and adoptees. And it was in that group that I started to consider searching. I actually decided not to search when I turned 18, I had always expected to search then. And I didn't because I actually was afraid of secondary rejection. I was at that point, uh, very, very openly gay and very involved in the gay community. And I was afraid that I might have discovered um, Catholic parents who were very involved in the church. And I was afraid they might be homophobic. And I just, I didn't feel capable of handling that at that time. So it was a couple of years later, actually, that my birth mother searched for and found me. And we reunited when I was 21. So now I know much more about who they were from their point of view, because I subsequently met my birth father. And we've been in reunion now 31 years. So I have much more understanding of who they were, how I came to be, and how I was relinquished. And the main thing I would add to the story now that I understand differently is that both my birth mother and my birth father left behind everything about the Catholic Church when they relinquished me. So while I was thinking of them that whole time, while I was growing up, I was thinking of them as Catholic. They really weren't Catholic anymore. And that's been really surprising because, and this part's a little confusing, (laughs) I know more about Catholicism than any of my siblings that were raised by my parents. Mm. Because my Jewish adoptive parents sent me to a Catholic school. And I got very excited about (laughs) religion. I really did. I loved religion class. It was confusing, yes, because I was still being taught the Jewish religion. I was going to Sunday school on the weekends, and I was expected to learn Judaism at the same time. So it was extraordinarily confusing between eight, yeah, uh, I between fifth grade and eighth grade, I was learning both religions side by side and very confused. So what was it like at home? being raised in a Jewish family. And I guess I'd also love your perspective on, you know, when you talk about Judaism in this world, it's there's a religion, there's also the ethnicity of being Jewish and biologically do like all of those kinds of factors into it. I think more than some other religions. So if you have comments on that, I would love to learn from you about that too. I realize it's difficult to summarize in, <laughs> in a in a quick way. Yeah. And and by the way, there are so many different ways to identify as Catholic. I just I just want to say as an adoptee, I sort of feel like I am living with a Catholic ethnic identity in addition to a Jewish ethnic identity. And most people don't think of Catholic as an ethnic identity. So I just want to start by saying, having been relinquished and realizing how many relinquishees come from Catholic families, I think in some ways being a relinquishee from a Catholic family is part of a certain kind of experience of being cast out and being unbaptized that is really painful and 
there's a lot of us. And in fact, I'm not the only relinquishee in my Catholic family. I just want to say that first. So the kind of Jewish family I grew up in, they saw themselves as offering Judaism as a religion only as a choice they wanted their children to make. So it was very important to them to give us the opportunity to choose whether or not we wanted to be religious. That already implies we came from the liberal tradition, because if you were a traditional Jew, you simply participate fully in Judaism because it's the way to be. It's the way to live. So as Jewish people from the liberal tradition, no one in my immediate family today goes to synagogue regularly or belongs to a synagogue. And along the way, there were years where we sometimes did belong to a synagogue and sometimes participated in Jewish holidays. I learned some stories that were biblical. I learned some ways of, let's say, cooking, or um, I learned some Yiddish. I probably learned more Yiddish than an average, you know, American in a large city would. But I realized that there might be people who grew up in New York who know more Yiddish than I do. So it's all very relative. I grew up knowing that there were certain Jewish causes that I needed to care about as though my life depended upon it, that we were living in mourning after the Holocaust, for example, or that we celebrated the creation of the Israel state. These were things that probably mattered more than whether or not I believed in God or used Hebrew to pray. But at the same time, I just, I think it's important to say this, one of the one of the first things that my family did when they adopted me is they made sure that I had a Hebrew name in addition to the name that was ultimately my, you know, English language name. My maternal grandmother, who is someone I consider to be my most spiritual connection in my life, she came from Poland at age five, she was not a religious Jew. She was a very passionate, what, what she would probably call was an ethical Jew. She, she felt that there were certain moral standards that she learned from Judaism that made her um, permanently like one of the people, but she belonged to a Unitarian church. She made sure I was given the Hebrew name Miriam, and that's one of the reasons the name Miriam is something that's so important to me now is that I feel like it was it was something she did to communicate to me that she considered me to really belong to her and the Jewish people and that there wasn't anything I needed to really do to prove it in terms of conversion or some level of religiosity. Does that make sense? It's kind of an emotional belonging, but there's more to it than that. It's like. I think she was trying to communicate to me that um, that we were related in some meaningful way that transcended just being legally family. That's so interesting. I know. Be- because even um, if you're thinking of Judaism as a ethnicity that's like passed down biologically, and then your adoptive family didn't necessarily see it that way for for you and your brother. And right. then she's passing this down, the spirituality. It's like all connected. <laughs> it is. But the thing that she gave me that I think no one can take away, and this is very meaningful to me, is she said to me when I was very, 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 very little that the warmth in my heart, and I remember she pointed to her heart when she said this, but she told me to point to my heart. She said, the warmth in my heart is the sensation of God. Which to me meant it wasn't either Judaism or my birth family, ultimately, that was giving me a a connection to God. It was essentially a birthright, but that she had the ability to help me learn it. 
And I do think she did. One of the things in, in, in Jewish uh, culture, I'm going to say culture, is this idea of a mensch. I'm sure you've heard that, that word. I've heard the word, but I don't really know what it means. So generally speaking, people use it to mean a good person. You'll call someone a mensch because they're selfless, they, are, um, they have integrity, and you can count on them. And what's interesting is, is that it's the highest compliment in Jewish community is to call someone a mensch. And the literal meaning of it is person. Isn't that interesting? It's not it's elevating like a human. <laughs> yes, you're not elevating yourself above, above someone else. Mm-hmm. You're treating someone as though they they have worth on the basis of being alive. So there's something in that for me that is very accessible. Mm-hmm. And by the way, it has not been enough for me. I went on to choose conversion to Judaism after my reunion. Because there was something in me that was yearning for a kind of belonging that I still felt like I didn't have. And reunion didn't give it to me. I think I was looking for a certain kind of belonging. And I think I, I was hoping it was going to be in the church. I never fully admitted that to myself, I should say. Because when I was at Catholic school, I want to tell you this. This story really bothers me still. Oh, wait, I have one to go. Did your brother go to Catholic school too? No. Okay, so they specifically sent you to Catholic school. Okay, okay, go with your story. I think I think it was an unconscious wish for me to have it better than my brother did in the in the schools at the time. Okay, so it wasn't like they adopted you they knew your birth family was Catholic. So this was some sort of like nod to them. It was just school choice. Catholic didn't really matter. It seems like that, Haley. It seems like that, but I can't help but wonder if there was an unconscious Mm -hmm. association. Mm -hmm. And at times I thought it was the worst choice they could have made because it was so confusing. And, and here's why. The worst part of going to a Catholic school was the way that religion was taught to me there. My adoptive family was going to hell because they weren't taking Jesus as their savior. And I had to choose between going to hell with them or being saved without them. And I couldn't explain that to them at the time. It was so confusing. I was being told not to pray to Jesus, even though I was crossing myself with the other kids every day, because that was expected. I was given exemption from genuflecting in front of the altar. I don't know what that is. Oh, there was a bending the knee and crossing yourself. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. And of course, I, at the same time, I also, I couldn't be forgiven for my sins. I couldn't take communion. I hadn't had any of the sacraments. I was unbaptized. So it was like a reinforcing of unbelonging. Mm. And at the same time, I really was drawn to Mary. I remember, you know, Mary was like my adoptive mom, Jewish mom. And I felt like I could relate to having also a, a yearning for, for like a, a feminine figure of holiness. I, I, I related to that also as if that was my birth mother. You know, here, here, is a, here is a woman who is a sacred figure who has all of this grief about letting go of her son, her child. You know, she was a grieving mother figure. That reminded me of my birth mother. So... And, and my yearning for what, you know, were, were my birth parents connecting to church and would I, would I be able to connect to them and to the church too? And then who did God think I was? Did God think of me as Jewish or as Catholic? That was a big mind 
concern of mine. So half the kids I knew were getting a bat mitzvah, and then the other half were going to uh, confirmation. And I got neither when I was 12. I was just, I felt a kind of nothingness at that age, and I sunk into a depression. So I don't want to gloss over that. It was a very painful, confusing time for me. I'm sorry. I, um, it's so it's interesting looking back at our young years, right when you're in identity formation and adding the religious and spiritual aspect to that, because totally. it's so, there's no black and white answers anyone can give you. <sighs> right. Right. And so, and if you're literally being taught two completely separate things during that time. Right. Plus you mix in the adoption. Oh my goodness. It's just like, whoa. Well, and I didn't say the other part of it, which is I was terrified that I came from Gentile people who were Jew haters. I was afraid that these were anti-Semites. These were the kind of people that were, you know, the Christians see Christians seemed very scary to me from the point of view of Jewish history because of the Holocaust. Like, what if the people who made me were the kind of people who hated Jews? That also kept me up at night. Hmm. Did you ever talk to your adoptive parents about any of this or is this all just kind of internal processing and um, yeah. I was writing in my journals. I was talking to God. I know I was unusual in this way. I've met a lot of people who didn't see themselves having a personal relationship with God or a conversation with God. And I did. I talked to certain people like a school counselor or a rabbi or a minister I sought out and I, I did confide in people. I was really afraid to, to find out how my, my parents and my grandmother really, how they really felt about me coming from Christians. So I tried to hide the parts of me that felt divided. You know, the, the loyalty. The loyalty was huge. So you said that as an adult, you fully, what's it called, converted to Judaism? I did. I did. And I'll tell you, I hoped to immerse myself so fully in a Jewish community that I would stop feeling torn. And when you told your parents that what was the reaction? Like, were you hoping that this would, or was this like completely for Mar? This is your choice completely for. No, no. I, I, re I remember saying I felt like the adoption was passive, that my role in the adoption was simply to, to be grafted onto their family and that I wanted to take an active role in choosing them. Now that I had known my birth family, and by the way, my birth parents were spiritual seekers, and they had each sought out different spiritual teachings and spiritual communities, and they were open to share theirs with me, and that was very natural. I would say our spiritual seeking is something that we share in common, but once I realized that my adoption made me Jewish— and that I probably would have had it much, much harder if I hadn't been adopted by my, my adopted family. I really wanted to make myself more fully Jewish. And if I hadn't done it, Haley, I would probably still be wondering if that could have resolved the pain that I felt about being divided. But it didn't work. So just to, for my clarity, you were choosing this and it was almost like an act of 
like an adult adoption into like yes. I'm choosing now to be grafted onto the adopted yes. family tree. Correct. This will make me fit and belong and feel okay. Um, but it didn't work. It didn't work because, <laughs> you know, deep down, I know it deep down. I think I wanted to be biologically Jewish. Mm. So is there like a imposter syndrome? Like, okay, so yes. you're fake Jewish. Yes. Even though you can choose to convert, it's still like, it's not real enough. It's not supposed to be that way. But unfortunately, there is a certain level of outsider status. If you have a bunch of Gentile relatives, which I do, and I always will. Can't fix that. And now I see, maybe it's the wisdom of middle age. Maybe it took going through that conversion and finding out that I still have these longings to belong in the Catholic spaces. For example, when my nephew died a year and a half ago, this is a biological nephew. I had such a yearning to to have the rosary. I did. I put a rosary around my neck. And even if I wasn't saying the prayers that go with the rosary, I still and, and I felt like I had to hide it and hide hide my rosary from my my Jewish friends and family. <laughs> I still felt like it gave me comfort. And then a year after he died, I lit a candle, which is the Jewish tradition for marking someone's anniversary of one's death. There, there are ways that I, I, it's like my soul calls out to both Judaism and to Catholicism at different times. And I really want now to be an example to anyone who may be able to identify with this why can't both be an answer to the question? I am both a member of my birth family and a member of my adoptive family. And when I go to the town where I have generations of Catholic relatives before me, uh, I'm from this particular part of my maternal family is in Red Buff, California. There's a church there. I want to go to that church. I want to sit in that church. I want to visit the relatives that are in that cemetery. You know, I, I want a sense of belonging in each place. I'm tearing up. I don't know. I'm, I didn't think, I don't know. I didn't think that was going to make me, um, tear up. Um, I I, I was going to ask you before you said that, I was going to go down this, but your bio parents were kind of like lapsed Catholics, if I can yes. call them that, when you found them. Yes. Um, so it wasn't them. It they was, can't relate to this at all. <laughs> it's like the history. You You have this real sense of like lineage is important to you. Right. That is correct. I really do. And maybe some of it is because I don't have children of my own. And I want to see myself part of a community where, for example, in a, in a synagogue community, I get to participate in rituals that have to do with those who die and those who are born. And, and then I can count on that community to be there when someone in my family dies, or if we get sick, you know, somebody to bring us food if, if, if we get sick, for example. And there are certain blessings that we say, and it's important to me, for example, to ask my partner to say those particular blessings if I, if I pass before she does, but it doesn't seem possible. I haven't yet figured out how to also have a relationship with a priest or a sister or a, a place where I could also 
ask for a blessing in a way that would feel connected to the Catholicism. Once you didn't feel like the adult conversion to Judaism uh, fixed things, <laughs> did you ever think of doing adult baptism in the Catholic Church or what? I don't know what the process is there, but confirmation and things. I just, I feel way too Jewish to be <laughs> able to do that. Okay. I I know there there are messianic Jews who consider themselves to be Jewish and Christian at the same time. But I think I can speak for all Jewish people and say if Jesus is your god, you are not Jewish anymore. <laughs> Can't they be both, Mar? <laughs> they can. I, I I am not one. I just, <laughs> I just, I laugh when you said that because I, um, I, the university I went to was a Christian university and I went to school with one gal who was a Messianic Jew. And oh. at the time I grew up in a very, very conservative Mennonite town and she was the first probably Jewish person I ever knew. And then Messianic Jew, I was like, I didn't know that was a thing. So, okay. God bless them and keep them in a different community from me. And I am I am a big jokester. I mean, I, I, I laugh a lot. Uh, I, I find pretty much every resolution of the Christian and Jewish relationship fascinating. It's just not, it's just not something, I, I don't think I can be myself and also take Jesus as God. And I, I guess I'm looking for a non-dualistic answer to the question. And I have sought support in meditation circles and I have studied Buddhism and I have looked for alternatives that allow me to look at the question without having to get into that black and white way of looking at it. And luckily in a way, I'm partnered with someone who is not theological by nature. She just, she finds her own relationship with divinity where she finds it. And she's able to go along with how I need to relate to a religious community. Because if she were very strongly one or the other, I think it would be difficult for me to to work with the, the two sides of me. I don't yet know, though, how we're going to have a wedding because it's difficult for me to imagine how to enter into a kind of new family, um, what shall we call that, ritual, it's a ritual. I don't yet have an idea of how to have that ritual that will really make room for and appreciate both sides. I have a fantasy, and I don't think anyone my, in my family will participate, but I have a fantasy that I could go down the aisle with my adoptive dad, my birth dad, and my stepdad walking me down the aisle. Why not? I just don't know that they would do it. Hmm. But that's my fantasy. Isn't it interesting that that's the barrier? It's the the people, the human yes. side versus I thought you were going to say, oh, I don't know, you know, who would do the service because that's right. not what you said. It's back to family. Hmm. Yes, that's it. <laughs> Mm. I so appreciate hearing your thoughts on this. And I guess before we wrap up, I'm curious, you mentioned being both and in the in-between. And do you feel like you're choosing moment to moment when you need to dip into spiritual whatever that looks like for you are you choosing like 
in this time I'm feeling Jewish and I'm, you know, going to do this thing or in this time I'm feeling, or is it just always just like intertwined? I just leave that to you to kind of describe your, what it looks like for you. I think that I'm at a turning point. There was a time when I worked in the organized Jewish community. There was a time I worked for a Catholic community service agency. And now that we've been on Zoom, I have, because of the pandemic, and I live in a rural community where I have to drive quite a way to get anywhere. Going on Zoom, I'll tell you, I have gone to mass. I have gone to mass at different churches around the world because I feel like I can do that without sacrificing some sense of my Jewish identity. So it could be that I am going to be creating something new that hasn't existed yet. And that's why I have no exact picture of what that is. I have a feeling I'm not the only one who feels a sense of true connection to each place. It isn't a false loyalty. You know, if I turn out to be more Jewish than my adoptive family and more Catholic than my birth family, (laughs) that'll make for a pretty fun party. (laughs) or a book I'll let you know okay well thank you for um, letting us peek into the world of Mar and what that means for you I appreciate it and I know I told you (laughs) before we record I think I probably told you three or four times before we recorded this is so uncomfortable for me I don't know how to talk about this and I come from a very one note perspective because of my upbringing and um, into adulthood what I've chosen for my spiritual life which I'm now really like examining in depth. So I'm very feeling very honored that you would bring us in to such a personal and, um, you know, fiercely private part of yourself. So thank you. It's, it is an honor to see up close. Thank you. Thanks Haley. I would love it if we could do some recommended resources to shift the tone. I guess. <laughs> well, When I left home, I went right into 12-step recovery. I fell in love with an adoptee who is an alcoholic. (laughs) And I went to Al-Anon. Why not? (laughs) Al-Anon. Right. (laughs) (sighs) Sounds like a joke. It's not. (laughs) Two two gay alcoholic adoptees walk into a 12-step room. Not a bad place to go. And Al-Anon is for friends and family of alcoholics. And that was 35 years ago. And I have stayed, I love a 12 step program. And it's one of the places I can go and I can be exactly who I am spiritually. And I don't have to choose whether or not I'm a Jew or a Catholic. So one of the places I can go as an adoptee is this adoptees and addiction meeting that takes place on Saturdays. And you had a recent guest who talked about that particular meeting, Miguel. I'm a friend of Miguel. Oh, Uh, tell us a little bit more about it while I look for what episode number that is. LOL. (laughs) So the Saturday afternoon meeting is 2 p.m. Pacific time. And it is for people from any 12-step recovery community, or if you identify as an addict or a person in recovery, you are welcome. And it's for adopted people who want to talk about what it's like to be in recovery. It's an hour long meeting and it happens on Zoom. Worldwide. 
Uh, Miguel was on the show on episode 176. So you don't have to scroll back too far. And he talks about why he created that space and a little bit more about it. So thank you for reminding us of that. And I wanted to recommend a fairly new development. I have had several of these folks on the podcast before, which is so fun for me, like collecting all your stories. <laughs> and um, anyway, so um, Adoptive Voices, it was started by Sarah Easterly, and she has been a guest on the podcast. And they have been doing adoptee writing groups, um, which if you're interested in that, this would be just like a fabulous opportunity for that. I think they're pretty full for the fall. But anyway, I really want to mention their e-zine and their blog. So there's adoptee writers that you and I both know that have submitted pieces to this. And it's just another amazing way for adoptees to have their work featured. Oh, I'm so excited. I threw my pen on the desk. <laughs> Um, so Sarah Easterly, I said, uh, founded it and there's other adoptees, uh, running the writing groups with her, like, uh, Jennifer Diane Ghostin and Ridge House and a few other folks. Oh, Alice Stevens. She was on the podcast as well. Um, just an amazing crew. They're leading both writing workshops and publishing online. I just love to see an adoptee centric space. Don't you, Mar? Yes. <laughs> You're giving me the thumbs up. Giving me the thumbs up. Love it. All right. I am so glad we got to have this conversation. Thank you so much for enlightening us a little. Is that a bad is that a bad pun? I don't know. No. Shouldn't we feel more enlightened at the end of a Absolutely. spiritual conversation? Honored. Yeah. Honored to know you. Where can we connect with you if we have more questions for you? I am very much interested in connecting with any adoptees on these topics. My name is Mar Miriam. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And my email address is rebelliondogs at yahoo.com. Perfect. Thank you. I will link to that in the show notes for everyone. Ask someone about those deeply personal things. What are the things you're not supposed to talk about at dinner parties with like new people? Like religion, politics, if they're vaccinated or not? <laughs> I guess that's the new question. Um, hopefully you know that before you have a dinner party with them. But I'm really, really thankful for Mar and for those of you that are willing to talk about these topics because they're on our minds. And as adopted people, navigating these things has a whole other layer, doesn't it? If you have something you want to share in the spirituality series and that you hope will be represented, um, you can apply to be on the show. I don't know if you knew that, but on the website, adoptieson.com, there's a link for guest applications. Make sure you read it very carefully and do all the steps <laughs> to make sure you're considered. Uh, I would love to ha keep having these conversations. Next week's podcast will be a little bit different. We are marking the second annual Adoptee Remembrance Day, which is happening on October 30th, 2021, if you're listening to this when it first comes out. And so next week's episode is a compilation of several adoptees who have thoughts on how they are marking Adoptee Remembrance Day, why it's important to them. And so it'll be a little different, probably more somber in tone. And yeah, so you can look for that in your podcast feed next week. And are you following the show or subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast app? If you aren't, you should, <laughs> because if you subscribe or follow in Spotify or Apple Podcasts or Overcast or Google Podcasts, wherever you like to listen, you will um, automatically get the next episode in your feed. And that's how I like to listen to podcasts. I use Overcast, it's my favorite app. And all my podcasts just automatically show up there when they're released. 
So I'd invite you to do that if you are, uh, if you haven't yet. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for listening. And let's talk again next Friday.